Okay, so this is, uh, I'm going to talk about some efficient methods, computational algorithms for solving uh, PDEs uh, with, which have random coefficients. And this was done jointly with Ki Fang Lao, who was a postdoc with me about a year ago. He moved to MIT. So here's an outline. Uh, I'm going to give you a kind of picture of the problem and some uh, aspects of solution algorithms for this problem. I'll talk a little bit about reduced order models, reduced basis methods in general, and then how they apply to this problem. And then I'll go into detail about uh, some of the specifics of using reduced basis methods for this problem. So here's a statement of the problem. Uh, I have a PDE with uncertain coefficients. So for example, we have uh, the diffusion equation at the top, at the top, or perhaps the Navier-Stokes equations. And uh, the point is here that we in contrast to the traditional uh, classical way of thinking about these problems, in general or often we don't really know what the coefficients are. We don't know what the porosities are, for example, in a model of diffusion. And rather than to take it to be constant or some specific function, we'll take it to be a random field, which means that for each uh, point in the spatial domain, x, there's a random variable. And we'll, we'll see what we can learn about the solutions of such problems when the coefficients are random. Now, you can have randomness in other places, like the right-hand side forcing function, but I'll just leave it at this in, in these examples. In the case of a fluid model, we might have multi-phase flows, but we don't really understand the properties of the different phases. So uh, I'm going to assume that the structure of the random field is given by an expression of this type. Uh, there are, there, this is not a completely straightforward statement, but I'm going to just take it as granted that this is what we know about it. In some cases, uh, it can be a perfectly valid thing. So I'm going to look at two examples, one in which I'll go into in a little more detail later, in which we know something about the covariance of the, of the uh, random field and we generate a Kahuna low F expansion associated with it. Alternatively, we can simply take the um, random field to be piecewise constant on some subdomains of the given domain, and um, which might correspond to, say, different, it, it might be a little bit more uh, meaningful to think about these as, for example, being horizontal or vertical subdomains where we know something that the, the porosities of different components might vary a little bit, but we're not sure how, and we call them random. So I should say before I move on, in both of these cases, we can express the random field in this way as a sum of components involving um, some finite number m of random variables. Okay, so let me begin with a, a beginning piece, okay, the kind of classical way of approaching this problem of randomness, which is Monte Carlo methods. Um, so if I write down the weak formulation, I'll, I'll stick to looking at the diffusion equation for these types of examples, and if I have time later, I'll talk about the flow problem. So here's a weak formulation of the diffusion equation. I'm not going to go into great detail about what the spaces are here. We have a discrete weak formulation, so we look, look for a finite dimensional approximation to the um, solution to the diffusion equation. Um, but now in these cases, we're taking A, the diffusion coefficient, to be this random field. So a way of doing Monte Carlo simulation is to take a set of realizations of A, sample the random parameter C, and then evaluate A at each of the, wherever we need them to do what we need to solve the discrete problem. These might be, for example, the finite element nodes, or perhaps at a few more places where there's quadrature involved, and solve for the realization just by using standard solution methods. Do this a, do this a number of times. That's a Monte Carlo method. Yes? Do you think assumptions about uh, A, such that the uh, partial differential operator remains uniformly elliptic? Yes. Like I'm okay. assuming that. It's behind the scenes. Okay. I'm making that assumption. Okay. That, that implies some, some statements about the distribution that A satisfies. Well, it's all under the table now, but I'm assuming it. Yes. Okay. So if you do this Monte Carlo simulation, you compute N. I'm writing it as N, so MC such sample solutions, you can then generate data associated with uh, statistical data. You can compute the sample mean, you can compute the sample variance, you can estimate probability distributions. For example, if you want to know the probability of some the solution being greater than some parameter, if you have some <coughs> pollutant and you want to know how, how big the concentration is, you can simply count how many, how many solutions satisfy that it's bigger than the parameter divided by how many solutions you have altogether, and that's the estimate for your probability distribution. 
this is standard classical way of doing simulation. And the problem, as everybody knows, is that Monte Carlo methods are slow. Now, there are variants of Monte Carlo that might be faster. My goal here isn't really to compare Monte Carlo to what I'm going to do, just to um, highlight the fact that we are well aware that these ideas are around. And instead, I want to talk about a different class of methods that was developed in the last 20 years called spectral methods, okay? Spectral methods for doing stochastic modeling. And uh, the first one, which was developed uh, in the early 90s by Roger Gannon as a grad student in, at Rice with his advisor Spanos, is called the stochastic Galerkin method. So let me describe that first, okay? Here's a weak formulation again at the top in the usual form. And now this we're going to assume that we have a probability measure that we know something about, and then we can write an extended weak formulation by extending the weak formulation to include the, um, the, the expected value with respect to the probability measure, which is what's written here. Okay, this is written in an abstract way, but in general, we're going to assume that we know something about the um, density function associated with this probability measure, so we can, we remember we have an m-dimensional random ex uh, term, we have an m-dimensional random variable, so we can write the extended weak formulation with respect to expected value or averaging um, using the assumed to be known density function and express a new weak formulation where we're now going to look for te look at test functions that are in the tensor product, the tensor product of the uh, um, spatial, the space, the, the, the functional space that the spatial solution lives in together with the, the stochastic space, the probability space. Um, this is kind of a trick. What it does is it, it's, it allows us to treat the m-dimensional random vector as though they play the role of Cartesian coordinates analogous to the d-dimensional uh, Cartesian coordinates in, in RD, okay, where D is two or three in our in our spatial model. Okay? Now D is three, or at most three typically in our application, so we're looking at two or three dimensional models. M could be depends on what our stochastic model is. It could be something small, perhaps three to five, or it could be a million. Okay? The methods that I'm going to be talking about today are really only practical when this m is on the order of tens at most, okay? Once we get to m equals 100, they get to be no longer practical. Monte Carlo is going to be more effective. But for moderate or low uh, dependence on parameters in our problem, um, these methods that I'm going to discuss today are quite practical. Okay, so when we, when we, uh, when we um, want to solve this problem, we want to solve it numerically. This equation is the analog of the continuous uh, formulation of the, the weak formulation of the problem, but we really need to have a discrete formulation of that. So we're going to discretize in space by some finite element hat function, and we're going to discretize in the space of random variables by some other basis. It turns out the basis we're going to use is polynomials of total degree p or something like that in the um, set of m variables, c1 through cm. So that will give us a uh, discrete problem to look at. Everything that I've, set, I've described so far is linear. It's coming from the diffusion equation. We can write down the discrete solution to be a linear combination of the product basis functions, which is the, the, the basis functions of the product space are these products of spatial, uh, ha, uh, sp spatial basis functions or shape functions and stochastic basis functions. So this method was, uh, it's been studied by many people. And uh, it's been around for now approaching 20 years. When it was first introduced, the, it had a, um, uh, one very negative component to it, which is that the size of the problem is now very big. Each one of, this is a picture of the non-zero structure of the coefficient matrix that you get when you do this. That coefficient matrix, it turns out, if we order the degrees of freedom in an appropriate way, has a very sparse uh, structure, which looks like this. It has a kind of hierarchical sparse structure. Um, each dot here corresponds to a block that's equal in size to the size of the spatial um, discretization. And there are as many of them as there are, there, there are as many dots or pixels here as there are the dimension of the stochastic component of the discretization, which is given by this. So this is a big, large, a big 
coupled system of equations which may be not so easy to solve. But this is an aspect of this method, the stochastic alertion method. And this is my entree into this business. Okay, uh, my, my background is in numerical linear algebra and solution algorithms. And uh, someone said there's a big hard matrix problem that we don't know how to solve, so I said, well, let me see if I can make any headway with this thing. And um, actually, before I say anything more, let me just kind of give an example of how one might solve this. There are two ways one can solve this problem, but what I'll focus on here goes like this. Here's the matrix that we have. It's a little hard to just... I could show you where these all come from. This, these matrices are um, the an analogs of the diffusion operator for the components A, J that appear in the, in the uh, sum. We have the sum A of X uh, omega looks like A0 of X plus the summation A, J of X psi, uh, psi J omega. Those terms a, j, a, a, j come from the ordinary um, weak form of this problem. Of this part of the problem. Okay, we simply take the spatial degrees of freedom, they decouple into matrices that have the non-zero structure of an ordinary finite on this I don't think I'm going to go into the detail of where the other matrices come from. They come from the analogous inner products that arise associated with the probability measure. And this term here corresponds to the mean, the, the component associated with the mean of the, the uh, coefficient, and it's just an ordinary discrete diffusion operator. Okay? So how can we solve this problem? We can solve this problem by using a um, precondition conjugate gradient method to solve it using the preconditioner coming from um, G0 tensor A0. This turns out to be the identity. So it's essentially a big block matrix consisting of an ordinary diffusion operator on every block. And the number of these is equal to that. Uh, I used the wrong letter M here. This is small m. The number of these things is m. However many degrees of freedom there are in the stochastic component. I know how to solve diffusion equations numerically using multigrid or whatever I like. Now I can solve these big systems using this as a preconditioner. All the operations of the preconditioner are completely independent of one another. It's a fully parallelizable uh, algorithm. It's easy to solve this problem, it turns out. And this is somewhat older work, and I wasn't going to go into the details of it in this talk, but. It, there's analysis showing how, uh, how, how, uh, what the condition number is. The condition number is well behaved. So what kind of P do you have uh, uh, in your numerical work? You said M is uh, about 10. So in the okay. types of examples that I'm looking at, M is on the order of 10 or less, mm -hmm. and P is on the order of perhaps at most 5. Okay? And I'll explain why P equals 5 is probably good enough in a, in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Meanwhile, because of the difficulty of this, this situation, there have been many uh, alternatives explored. And another alternative to Monte Carlo and to this that of the structure of spectral method is called the stochastic collocation method. And a way of thinking of collocation is like this. Monte Carlo again samples the parameters at various uh, choices and then does some kind of Monte Carlo simulation. An alternative is to choose a set of parameters in a special way using so-called sparse grid methods. So this grid is a picture. This picture here is a grid that's sitting in the stochastic, in this case, 3, m equals 3 dimensional stochastic space. Sparse grid methods are techniques for computing uh, uh, interpolation, in interpolated functions or doing quadrature on a set of grid data that's perhaps less than the full tensor product of grid data in a big n-dimensional space. So you try to somehow capture the properties of tensor product grids, but with fewer points. And with the collocation method generates an interpolant to the solution of the stochastic weak form by interpolating the solution at a certain distinguished set of points called sparse grid points. 
it has a big advantage over the Galerkin method that I described a moment ago because it doesn't require, um, because everything's independent, okay? The, it, it behaves like Monte Carlo, but uh, by choosing a uh, discrete set of points that aren't coupled together, okay? It also, I didn't say it, but the Galerkin method is actually not so easy in, a, in settings where the operator is linear, is nonlinear rather than linear, and this is much more amenable to uh, solving nonlinear problems. So it's a quite good method as well. Okay, here's the key aspect of these things that make them good competitors to the Monte Carlo method. There's an error analysis due to Babushka and co-workers that shows that the error, if I, if I look at the error, which means here, the H1 norm, for example, of the mean, the, the, the mean of the solution versus the mean of the discrete solution, the H1 norm is bounded by a sum of expressions that essentially look like the usual finite element error. So this would be the type of finite element error, the H1 norm for linear elements, together with an expression that depends on the um, polynomial approximation in the stochastic space. And the, the key thing is that it's an exponential <coughs> for some parameter r less than 1. Okay, so there's a, an error analysis of this thing. This, this stochastic finite element and Galerkin method, they both have bounds of this type, okay? It's exponential in this, in this parameter p, the polynomial degree. So p equals 5 is a pretty good number to raise a power to if you have something less than 1. This number that's less than 1 is going to depend on the number of terms in the sum, okay? The number of terms here, okay? If m is on the order of 5 or something in that range, then it's going to be not uh, really less than 1. If it gets to be a 1,000 or a million, then it's only marginally less than 1. So that's one reason why these methods are less practical in the large parameter setting. And as we well know, the contrast between uh, the, the error type of an an analysis that exists for Monte Carlo is uh, that you get error bounds, probabilistic error bounds that are proportional to 1 over the square root of uh, the number of samples, and that's very slow. There are other methods out there that can improve things, but this is a kind of classic Monte Carlo method. So this is the advantage to get this exponential convergence. That's why they're viewed as being important. And let me just make one comment. I'm now going to make some comparison between the two methods. And the, 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 the symbol P means something slightly different for Galerkin and collocation. Without getting into all the details, let me just make the assertion that to get accuracy of comparable size in this error measure, the uh, number of degrees of freedom for collocation is about 2 to the p for the number of degrees of freedom for Galerkin. What does that mean? In the case of Galerkin, it's this number, okay? It's the m plus p choose p that I talked about. And, and this is an empirical observation that in order to get comparable accuracy, you actually need many more points. Okay. Now, the number of points here is, they play a different role for collocation because the, 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 the problems are decoupled, but nevertheless, there are more of them. And because, well, I'll tell you what the significance of that is in a moment. Okay, so here's a result of, uh, I, I had a graduate student, Chris Miller, who I uh, suggested look at this problem. I said the first, the first thing he did was to simply code these two things up and to do an empirical study how costly is one versus the other, okay? And uh, at the time this was happening, which is perhaps eight years ago, the Galerkin method was in complete disrepute, and maybe it still is in a way, okay? Because people hate this system, okay? And the other one looked really good, okay? Collocation looked really good. But there is this overhead of the number of points. So this picture shows two things. It shows Galerkin in uh, blue, collocation in red. If I look down, any given value here. This is for different choices of the symbol p, what the error is. So for example, for the same value of p, the errors are comparable, okay, for the two methods. So for p equals 4, the errors are about the same size there, this number. I know this is blurry, this is like 10 to the minus 4. If I look across here, this is a measure of the computational cost. Using the best method, best method I can throw at the Galerkin method versus an analogous solver for the colligation method, which again just depends on classic methods, multigrid, for solving each of the components. What we did here, we coded it up, and the, the blue lines are the, the solid lines are the coded values, and the, the dotted lines are a paper model, just in an effort to not look like we were trying to win with one choice or the other, okay? The models basically lie on top of the, just a paper 
pencil and paper analysis of computational complexity versus CPU time on an actual implementation. And so this is the time to solve a problem. Now this is on a log log scale. So for example, for this choice of P, this is about 10 to the 3, this is about 10 to the 6. It's much more expensive to solve the problem using collocation than using Galerkin. And that is because of the extra degrees of freedom that we need to work with. So that's just a fact of life. What's the definition of the error here? The definition of the error. Um, I believe, I'm not positive now, that I'm, but I believe it's the expected value of the solution. Because okay. the norm may change if you consider yeah. it. Yeah, it won't, but it may. But it's the expected value of the, uh, okay. the solution. Okay, well, I'm not, I uh, consider myself an equal opportunity employer, okay? If you have a problem that needs solution, I would like to try to help you solve it. I don't mind whether it's the learning method or the collocation method, but this was an honest effort to try to understand this, and we saw the collocation was less effective, and the question is, can we do better with collocation? Because it is much more flexible. Okay, a few words about reduced basis methods. So I'm going to say a, few, a little bit about not my own work on this subject, okay? So by the way, I'm talking about stochastic PDs, but this is a methodology that's applicable in general to parameter-dependent PDs. You have a parameter-dependent problem, you want to do a simulation for multiple choices of the parameter. Um, maybe you want to do it because you're doing this stochastic thing and you want to get expected values or moments or distributions. Or maybe you just want to simulate the semiconductor for multiple choices of the parameter space. Whatever you want. We have a parameter-dependent PDE. Here it is diffusion again. Here we discretize again. I'm writing it in a generic way. It could be a nonlinear system, but we're only going to concern ourselves. Well, we have a mild nonlinear system for the flow problem. The issue is, if you want to do this many times, it's expensive, okay? If you have to solve a large three-dimensional PDE on a very fine grid multiple times, it's expensive. The question is, can you reduce it, you reduce the cost? And there's a methodology called reduced order modeling that has many different flavors. I'm gonna talk about one that uh, is developed by Tony Patter at MIT and a lot of his collaborators, okay? And the, the, the approach goes like this. By some means, choose a set of sample values of the parameter, solve the problem on those sample values, and then try to find the approximate solution for any other parameter to be coming from the space spanned by the sample parameter solutions that you've chosen, which are called snapshots. So the idea is that one hopes that the solution for this whole parameter space lives, in fact, on a smaller dimensional manifold spanned by a certain number of these things. Um, here's a way to generate the snapshots, okay? Choose a candidate set of parameters, perhaps some large random set of parameters in the full parameter space. Choose an initial one, compute the solution, declare the reduced basis that you're going to generate to be that single solution. I'm writing this now in terms of functions, okay? But in fact, boldface means vector, not boldface means function. In the end, we're going to do something with matrices, and so that's why the bold face and the matrices have to be introduced, okay? And we have, so, in addition, we have some error indicator, eta, okay? And what we like to do is generate a reduced basis, solve the problem for a new parameter using the reduced basis we have. If our error indicator says that that, that uh, error for the new problem using the reduced basis is small enough, then we're happy. We have a good reduced basis. If not, augment the reduced basis with something. And the way Pattera talks about it is find the largest error in indicator, okay, by doing a greedy search or by doing an optimization or doing something. Find the eta, the, produ the C that produces the largest error and augment your reduced basis with that thing. Then you have a new Q. It's bigger than it was before and do it again. We generate Q and then we use a gram schmidt to orthogonalize it. And we do this until um, we find that for any parameter we use, we're always less than our tolerance. And we say, we have our reduced basis and we're going to work with that from here on. Now this could be expensive. We may have to find, do a lot of solids to generate this. But this is viewed as, a, as, as what's called an offline computation. You do this before you send your engineer out into the oil field and then you send that engineer with the reduced basis to do the work, 
and then they start sampling again using the reduced base, using only the parameters, using the parameters that they want to simulate, but using the reduced basis. So the offline step may be expensive, but we'll do it offline, and the online step is going to be done on the fly using the reduced basis. <coughs> Here, how do you choose these set of parameters? You can do a greedy search. You can pick some large number of random 10,000 parameters, search for the maximum uh, error across all of them, and build the basis in some way. You can alternatively, alternatively try to find, optimize your error functional uh, by using an optimization code to do that. And that also works as work by Karen Wilcox and Omar Gottes that showed that they, they do pretty well with that. We found for our example that these two didn't do too differently, but there are many ways to uh, try to find the reduced basis. We're going to use sampling from sparse grids when we do it in, in this study, okay? So it's not our concern, okay? We're going to generate the reduced basis, and then we're going to use it to do the simulation. Okay, how do you conduct, how do you concoct the reduced problem? Okay, here's the set of snapshots. Here's the coefficient matrix in the linear setting. Here's an orthogonal matrix that this column span the snapshots, and a way to generate the reduced model is to impose a Galerkin condition. Make the we're looking for a solution which lies in the space spanned by the snapshots, which is spanned by this orthogonal matrix. Impose a Galerkin matrix uh, condition, force the residual to be orthogonal to the, the reduced spaces. You can do Petrov Galerkin also. Um, so then solving the reduced problem means solving a problem of smaller size, the size of the reduced spaces. I'm using the letter small n for this, and small n should be much smaller than the size of your discrete model, which is the size of, say, a 3D problem. And the idea is that the reduced solution should be cheap to find, and it should capture the features of the model. Okay. In the type of example that I was writing over here, our matrix is, this is not the Galerkin form now, but for any realization, our matrix is going to be a sum of this form. I'm assuming now that I have an affine dependence on the parameters, okay? This isn't always true, but we're going to only worry about the problems of this type, which is true for the example that I talked about. In that case, in order to do this reduced order model, every time I choose a new C and have a new simulation to do, I can pre-compute all these quantities once and um, save them, and then assembling the new reduced problem is relatively cheap. It doesn't depend on capital N, the size of our problem. It only depends on the order of this matrix, which is going to be of order small n. Okay, so we pre-compute these offline. We're looking at linear problems. The way we think about solving this linear system in the end is going to be by Gaussian elimination. Okay. So the, the choice is to solve the small problem by gas elimination and to solve the big problem by whatever we can use, okay? And we hope that the small problem is so small that it's cheap to work on, to, 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 to use gas elimination for that problem. It's much more, there, there are complexities for nonlinear problems which people have thought about, but I'm not going to get into them today, okay? I'll, I might say a little bit, but it's much more tricky when you have to use reduced order models for nonlinear problems. Okay, now there's an error indicator that has to be computed, and the error, you, all, you also want the error indicator to be independent of the size of your large problem. And uh, so, for example, we're going to use the residual norm as the error indicator. It's not a very sophisticated error indicator in the finite element setting. There are finite element error indicators out there, but we use something that's naive, okay? And um, to make this cheap, you have to actually have to be careful also. You have to do very, in order to get the residual norm, you have to do a lot of, you do have to do some stuff offline as well, so that the online, I mean, I'll use a letter K here, this really is the same thing as N before. You have to be able to make things independent of the cat, the large N, the, 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 um, the uh, size of your full system problem. But it can be done. If there's time, I might say a word about this afterwards. Does anyone see anything that might be problematic about this computation? Lin numerical linear algebra people. Okay, 
you can think about it. I'll leave it till later. Okay, so there are two issues, making the cost cheap and capturing the features of the problem. Let me look at the latter thing first, okay? Here's the type of examples that I just uh, talked about. We have a, a parameter dependent problem with piecewise constant random variables on, each, on subdomains, okay? Either vertical subdomains or square subdomains. And the question is, is it really true that the, you can get a solution that lives nicely on this small dimensional manifold. So here's an experiment we did. We have a set of parameters that live in some space, perhaps some n-dimensional space, uh, a rectangle, of some, uh, a square of some sort, uh, okay? And we'd like to be able to represent any solution associated with any of these parameters using a, a small set of snapshots, okay? So to test this idea, we took a, we took a finite subset of this set of all possible parameters computed the matrix derived from um, all the solutions from this finite set, 3,000 is how big we've made it, okay? And then compute the rank of this matrix. How big is it, okay? We're a random collection of sample parameters. If the rank of the matrix is much smaller than 3,000, then we have the hope that the small manifold is gonna do the job, okay? So this is just an experiment. And here's the results of that experiment. And there's a lot to see on this table. First of all, these are two benchmark problems. Is a PDE grid, okay? I'm refining the grid, or I should say, keep fan refining the grid multiple times. For each one of these choices of grids, I looked at a set of parameter sets, okay? Two parameters, three parameters, up to 10 in this case here up through 64, and looked at the rank of these matrices derived by choosing 3,000 samples. And if I focus on this one first, the rank is 55, okay? Chose 3,000 samples, compute, a big, compute the SVD of this matrix of size 3,000 times 3,000 columns times this many rows, find its rank is 55, okay? Independent of the mesh size here. It's a property of the PDE not a property of the discrete matrix. This is a, actually something I don't understand. Why is this true? I don't really know why. We can say, we can represent the solutions to all the parameterized problems using a space of dimension 55. The space of the, the problem is, you know, in this case, 16,000. Here's a different model. I highlighted this one because they're also pretty much constant, PD independent. Here they're not quite constant, okay, for a larger number of parameters. Although I believe it's reasonable to take the point of view that they're asymptotic to something that's constant. This is 450, this is 900, this is 1300. It's, it, the growth is slowing. I'm sure it's true. We just don't have a fine enough mesh to see what we really see in the PDE. So there's several things to observe, okay. I've already made my assertion that it's PDE it's only PD dependent, it's not dependent on the discretization, modulo the asymptotics here. But the size of the reduced basis, well, this reduced basis is of size 55. That's pretty small. You can solve dense matrix problems of size 55 with no difficulty. The size of this reduced matrix is going to be, say, 1,500 or perhaps 2,000 in the end, okay, if we want to do it right. That's not that big, okay. But on the other hand, if you compare the cost of Gaussian elimination for a matrix of size 2,000 to the cost of multigrid for a matrix of size 16,000, you're not clearly winning here, okay? So there's a small issue here, which I won't address. I, I have, I'm working on that issue. We have a solution now, but I won't address it today. <clears throat> this is, that last point is related to this thing. The treating the reduced problem is, is using a low rank thing, but how, how low does it have to be? Well, you know, in the end, we're gonna to wanna to make this finer, okay? We don't want this to be, this is not fine enough yet. Perhaps we need it to be, you know, 256 squared or 512 squared or something like that. But this is a small issue that can't be ignored. But the real point is that the number 55 is what we really care about. Okay, that's preliminary. Now I'm gonna talk about, in the 15 or so minutes that I have left, some developments, new de combining these two points of view. Collocation together with reduced basis methods. 
Here's the collocation solution. It's an interpolant using Lagrange interpolating polynomials of the solution at a distinguished set of points coming from the sparse grid. And uh, what we want to do, and this was costly because the number of solutions, the number of sparse grid points that I need to use to get reasonable accuracy was on the high side. And I can't change that. That's a fact of collocation. But what I have the potential to change is to replace the full sparse, the full discrete solution with the reduced discrete solution, which is going to be cheaper. <clears throat> so here's an algorithm to do that. It's basically the same type of greedy algorithm I talked about before. As we go through the sparse grid, compute the solution at the sparse grid. Before I or, or sample this, take a, take a node from the sparse grid, compute the reduced solution at the sparse grid. Again, starting with a reduced model with just one. I didn't say it here. We have to start with one. Okay? Look at the error tolerance. If the error tolerance is met, then we're going to use it in our collocation solution. We're going to use a reduced solution as our collocation component. If it's not, then augment the reduced basis and use the full system here, the full solution in our collocation solution, and then repeat. Okay, look at more sample points, more members of the sparse grid, and do this until. Um, until we look at all the levels that we're going to use in our sparse grid. So here's an example of what can happen. Okay, this is the first of the two that I looked at a few minutes ago. Now we're going to look at the effectiveness of the reduced basis. So let's just look at this single table here. It tells you what you want to know. Okay, P, uh, this is labeled in a slightly funny way. P and Q here. This has to do with the difference between P's in the collocation versus Galerkin. But the point is, I'm increasing my exponent in that R to the P as I go from left to right. Okay? I'm getting more accuracy. In order to achieve that increased accuracy, this is how many sparse grid nodes I have to work with as I go from left to right. For P equals, remember P is uh, M is 5, so P here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in this case. Okay. So for this example, I have to solve 2,400 systems. But if I use my reduced basis methodology, the number of systems that I need to solve in order to obtain the reduced basis is this number. Total here, if I look here, of 22. In order to get essentially the same accuracy, okay, instead of 2,400, 22. Or at any rate, it's with 22 systems that I can meet the tolerance defined by this question in my reduced basis building algorithm. So we can reduce the overhead. We still have the same number of sparse grid points we need to work with, but we only have to solve reduced systems on those sparse grids using matrices of rank in this range, okay, in the 20s. Now, the underlying rank of the space was about 30, and what we found is that the number of reduced, um, number of full systems that we need to generate in order to compute the reduced basis was consistent with those ranks, okay? Here's another example with a rank that was 70, and we need about 60. So we believe that that study about the PDE is telling us what we are trying to learn about how effective the reduced basis really is going to be when we compute it. And we can reduce the overhead significantly by simply replacing the full system solves with a reduced solve generated by a handful of snapshots. That handful is going to be more than a handful in the case where I had 1,300 before. It's going to be in that range, okay? But it's still going to be much smaller than these numbers. This is the same story for another example. The story hasn't changed. There's one thing I haven't shown you yet, though. I've shown you that I've met a certain tolerance in an algorithm that I've described, okay? But I don't really know whether the accuracy of my solution is what I want it to be yet, okay? It's just that I've satisfied some error tolerance associated with a matrix residual. But what I'd really like is to have some norm of the error. And again, the norm here is going to be the norm of the expected value, in this case 
guess we decided to use the L2 model. So what am I going to show you next? I'm going to show you a picture of, um, what do we do? We generated a reference solution, which we're going to declare to be the truth solution, for a very uh, large, uh, very large what? A very large number of sparse grid nodes. Okay? So we generated a truth solution using a very, as basically as fine a set of sparse grid nodes as we can work with. And then we use a, a smaller set of sparse grid nodes and look at the expected value of the difference relative. Similarly, similarly for the reduced solution, compare that to the truth solution, for both the expected value and the variance. So we have measures of the accuracy of the reduced solution obtained with these 10 or 20 or 30 solves. And here's a picture. So there's several things on this picture. The main thing has to do with these curves, which are two colors. Blue, which is the reduced solution. Red is the full collocation solution with all those degrees of freedom. They lie right on top of each other. Okay? They're equally accurate with respect to these two measures. Just for the hell of it, we also included some results on the Monte Carlo errors. Okay? Similarly generating a true solution for Monte Carlo and a, and a, and a uh, um, <coughs> Monte Carlo solution. We're not trying to compare with Monte Carlo. I'll, I'll be more careful about that in a moment. But it, in, this, in this example, they're a little more effective than Monte Carlo. But the real thing we want to show is this. The two things lie one on top of the other. So we're getting what we want with this cheap computation. So did you use the, did you try to reduce bases in the Monte Carlo calculation? We didn't. You can, but we didn't. It works also. There are other people who've done that. Yeah. Uh, I just showed you the expected value of the means. These are the variances. The main story is the same, the blue and red lie one on top of another. It turns out that for the variances, the Monte Carlo estimate for the sample variance is actually better than the Monte Carlo estimate for the spectral, met uh, for the spectral estimate for the variance, except, once, except if you start getting a very fine um, sparse grid. I have no understanding of that point. Okay? It's just the fact that we observe. But it's a secondary point for our study here. Our study was to compare these two, but it's not a trivial one. Okay. Uh, I want to try to give you an honest assessment of that blue versus red that I've been talking to you about. Okay? I tried a different example problem. Instead of the piecewise constants on subdomains, we looked at a KL expansion generated by a known covariance ex uh, expression. And we found in that case, actually, that this is the red here, the bottom line here, is the, uh, <coughs> is the full version of the solution, the one that requires all those samples, uh, all those full sums, okay? But if you recall also, there was a tolerance in the error indicator that we were using, and it turns out that the tolerance made a difference in this setting where it didn't make much difference in the other one. So we need to refine the tolerance more in order to get the two curves to live one on top of the other. And for a moderate value of the tolerance like this one, they don't. The reduced solution, even though it met the criterion for being built, it wasn't as accurate as the actual full solution. Now, it still was reducing things by about four orders of magnitude, but it did stop. Okay? So I don't claim to have an understanding of that either. But uh, for moderate values of tolerance like this one, we were able to reduce it by, we, we were able to get the agreement, the error to go down to by six orders of magnitude. So we're not too unhappy with that, although we don't understand why this is a problem. And in this particular example, Monte Carlo wasn't as good. But that's a secondary point again. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure. Um, you said the, what's the dimension of the reduced order? Um, I don't have that right at my fingertips. They're small, though. I, I don't. Small. I don't know what they are. But this, these examples, I, I think I have them somewhere, but I don't know what they are. But they're on the order of ten or fifty or something.
it's worth pointing out a fact about this algorithm that I just described. In contrast to what I described as this patera technique, where you do this offline computation, it's set in stone, and that's the end of the story. Later, the field engineer will only use the reduced basis. Here, the, these, in the algorithm that I described, these things were not separated quite as distinctly. You had to, you're going to do this just once in order to generate the simulated solution and um, the, the error uh, statistics. And so the question is, um, how, how, how bad is it? Okay? And the answer is, as long as the answer to this previous question is what, what I said is true, if the number of times when I need to augment the reduced basis as I build it isn't too big, then the overhead associated with generating it is going to be small because I simply don't have to do a lot of full system solve. I simply can't avoid it. There's some overhead, but there's not much. So although the two approaches are not completely separated as they were before, it's not really much of a matter. And I can be more precise about that if anyone would like to hear it, but it's no major overhead. Okay. Um, I, can, I have more to say about doing the exact same set of experiments for the Navier-Stokes equations. And the short story is going to be that it works just about as well. Okay. So I don't know if I need to go into all the gory detail about this. I think I will just highlight one point. which is having to do with the nonlinearity. And obviously Stokes equations are nonlinear, but there's only a quadratic nonlinearity. Okay, so it's a mildly nonlinear problem. If you recall for the diffusion problem, I assumed this affine dependence. And by making that assumption, I could pre-compute a lot of the stuff that I needed to do in order to do any of these types of simulations. Now I need to, now it's more complicated, okay, because um, the things that I might want to pre-compute depend on the solution, okay, and so I may need to recompute this every time I computed the solution, and that's not good news. But it turns out that because of the quadratic nonlinearity, I can get away with not as much of a difficulty, okay, so let me see if I can explain that. Nonlinearity comes from the convection term, which is here. So I have a u that grad u in the Navier Stokes equations. What we do is, in the case of a Picard iteration for solving this, we lag the, we compute a correction. I, I, can, I can write this down here. I can show it to you. Picard iteration solves for a correction. the velocities and pressures using the old, the previous iterate of velocities and pressures. Okay, I'd like to make this point coherent. And in order for that to be true, it has to be coherent in my mind. So uh, let me see if I can make this, get this straight. try to avoid is having to do a computation of the form Q A, Q transpose A Q. This is a big matrix A. These are sm small skinny matrices. I don't want to have to do this. I want to compute this once and for all and save it. And I'm claiming here that I can do this for the convection term also, but now I, I have to admit I'm not seeing it. Sorry. 
you're using the your views are expressed in the in the Q basis as well. Right? So you've got uh, so yes. that, that QU is appearing in your NI down. That's correct. That's right. The, that's correct. Thank you. So the solutions at every step are appearing in the the reduced solutions are always appearing in the basis of the reduced set. And so I can once compute those things offline. There are more of them. Previously, there were a small number. Then there were as many terms as there are in the sum. Now there are as many terms as there are in the um, size of the reduced basis. There might be more of them than there are in, let's say, what happens in the diffusion equation, but they can be computed offline. Thank you. Okay. And it works. So here's just one picture of the number of uh, size of the reduced basis that we generated compared to the number of full system sums that we would use without a reduced basis. And once again, I have blue sitting on, I have Monte Carlo, and I have blue sitting on top of red again. So it worked for this nonlinear example. And I think I probably should stop there. I mean, I have more examples, more data, more pictures, but they all tell the same story. The idea works. Let me just conclude with one little observation, which is um, I have to solve this problem and as I said when A is of size uh, say 16,000 and Q is of size 1300 it's not obvious that you're better off using the Gaussian elimination to solve this problem compared to multigrid for solving a problem without any reduced spaces okay it is not but uh, We've been, uh, I've been addressing this problem. I don't have anything prepared today. If anyone's going to be attending the Cyan meeting in UQ in a couple of weeks, I'll talk about this. You can do this with iterative, iterative methods and still win, okay? Not gas elimination. Gas elimination is going to lose if the reduced basis is, the reduced, the reduced basis n could be much smaller than n, but not so much smaller that the n cube that you have to do with gas elimination is going to be order n in, um, in uh, uh, multigrid, but you can use multigrid to solve the reduced problem as well and, and get, avoid, uh, get away from that problem. I think I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. The, um, so if I understood correctly in the model problem that you were using, Coefficients basically in your in your expansion corresponded to the uh, perturbations to you yes, know, the velocity, for example, in each of those little squares. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder whether the uh, the parameterization of that space has an impact on the convergence rate. So I might imagine, for example, parameterizing the uh, same set random random space uh, and trying to do something where I did uh, a Fourier representation, so I was, you know, some coordinates corresponded to the high frequency yes. uh, variations and some to the lower frequency variations. And yes. since you've got this smoothing effect from the elliptic operator, they might have different behaviors. Is that, is that yeah, something? it's entirely different? plausible. There are many, many issues associated with this. They're all swept under the table by what I'm saying here, but there are many, many complications. Is this a really, well, you know, if you have this piecewise constant thing, that seems not unrealistic to me. The KL expansion has its issues. And you could have, alternatively, for example, something which is used commonly, a log normal distribution, where the, the, the log of the, um, of the, of the um, coefficient matrix is normal, okay, with a nice expansion, but it's an exponent of that. And then a lot of the things that I'm talking about here are actually out the window. I didn't say it, but it's true. And you are raising up, I think what you are suggesting would also lead to some issues. Okay. There was a question earlier about that the underlying operator stays elliptic, and you said you make that assumption, right? Yes. Uh, did, what, uh, it's hard for me to imagine that it was uh, 
go non-elliptic? That... Yeah, well, it's directly related to the point that was just raised. If you take the terms that appear here as being Gaussian, which is not an unrealistic thing to say about a random variable, um, then they go from minus infinity to plus infinity, and it stops being elliptic. That's, the, that's just a fact. Okay? That's one reason why people will switch to having, instead of, instead of A being of this form, A being e to the c, where c is of this form. Okay? In that case, you can guarantee positivity. Even there, you have to be careful, because it can still go to minus infinity, and you don't have uniform boundedness below. People wave their hands at all these things right now. It's not uh, kosher, but it's done. Uh, well, I don't want to keep you, but I, I raised this question before. So it was, uh, I don't ordinarily give exams after my talks, but uh, um, since no one's getting up. Do, okay. do you have any speculations about why uh, the Order calculations are so effective. Are so effective. Okay, uh, this is a big, uh, this is a big mystery to me. In truth, okay, there's a paper by Danny Sorensen where he makes an observation. We think this has something to do with the uh, attraction, the manifold of attraction of some dynamical system. One sentence in there. That's my answer right now. But I would love it for someone who, can, who knows more about dynamical systems than I do to be able to make an assertion like this. I don't know. But it has uh, many implications, OK? And who was I talking to about this this morning? I was talking to uh, Zabaris. And he said it's a miracle, basically. So. <laughs> Okay, well, no one's getting up, so I'm going to give you my quiz. <laughs> you don't have to stay. You don't have to. It's voluntary.